Um, good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us tonight. This is the first time we're starting or testing the eight o'clock. Uh, so for hopefully you finished your dinner, you're enjoying and really relaxing, and uh, we welcome you to stay with us and keep your questions, as Miguel said, and put them either in Q&A or sometimes people get confused with the chat. We'll be checking on both. And at the end, we'll have an open conversation with Robin Bell. I am Vesela Sertanovich, a senior creator of Modern and Contemporary at the Phillips. And it is really hard to introduce Robin. I feel like everybody in the city knows him. He is part of the Phillips family, a multimedia artist, probably best known for his, if I may say, gorilla projections around the city and outside of Washington proper, but specifically here in Washington. Um, and an artist who has also his own company, Bell's Visuals, uh, an artist who started, as some of you may know, as a printmaker and then shifted to film and journalism and um, is doing primarily what he's going to be talking about, and that is um, outdoor projections. Um, he's been showing his work at numerous places in, at Kennedy Center here at the Phillips not long ago but he has many more connections to the Phillips and to the Phillips family. And, uh, but he'll tell us more about that last year. He had a show at the Cork Reynolds Gallery, uh, part of the George Washington University now. And now as we speak, you can actually go and see his work at the Martin Luther King Library outdoor projection. With that, with a little introduction, let's go to uh, Robin. Robin, thanks so much for accepting our invitation to join us tonight. And um, let's, um, let's start with your beginnings. Um, I didn't even know that you started as a printmaker and when and how that shift occurred to you doing the projection. Yeah, if you'd asked me 20 years ago today, I, I would say uh, I was in the middle shift in between being a printmaker to a videographer. Um, you know, I started out, I loved music. So I always, you know, when, when I got out of high school, you know, I had this amazing class with Mike Platt, who was an amazing, who was an amazing printmaker in Washington, DC. And I was his student and he really um, gave me the encouragement to say, you can be an artist. And so I really jumped head, head just right into projecting. I mean, right into printmaking. And, um, you know, I signed up for this, like, program that I saw on the wall that said go to Florence, Italy and learn how to be a printmaker. And so 20 years ago, to this day, I was actually in Florence learning how to be like a master printmaker. Um, but in that time period, I, you know, was always trying to figure out how to, you know, document things. And at the time, photography really was kind of the thought I had, like, you know, and turned that into prints. Um, but then I ended up getting a uh, you know, arrested in Washington, D.C. 20 years ago um, at, at a prison industrial complex protest uh, that was part of those, these protests against the World Bank and IMF. And I was like a student, you know, printmaker slash journalist student at Northern Virginia Community College. And, you know, I was shocked by what I saw. And the next day I read the news and it wasn't what I had seen. Like I, I knew I had been illegally arrested with 700 other people. Um, and so when I went Tell to us Italy, when was it? Tell us. That, that was uh, April fifteenth, uh, two thousand, and that and that changed my life because. And what was the occasion? Uh, I mean, yeah, it was. I mean, this was just a. It was a uh, not just. It was like a really important protest um, around the prison industrial complex, and and specifically it was framed around the World Bank IMF protests because if people remember from Washington D.C., you know, the early like you know two thousands, there was a lot of pressure. <laughs> about the World Bank and the IMF and the structural adjustment programs that were going on. And as a, as a young person, I was like, this is something I can really um, help document. And I thought making art was, even then I thought making art was important, but I thought printmaking was the way I could do it. Because I, I thought that it was really important to figure out images and then have them last for a long period of time. It's why I loved prints was this idea that a print, if I made a really good print, I could share it with people and it wasn't just a singular thing like a painting. Um, and I think that's why, you know, after this event happened, I realized the, the still camera wasn't fast enough to really capture what I was trying to document. So I got my very first video camera. I saved up my money, I got a video camera, and then I went to Italy with this amazing program of learning how to be a printmaker. And while I was there, I, I went to a protest in Prague where, um, where I filmed this World Bank IMF meeting that got shut down. But I filmed it and I filmed it with all these other people. And I met these, this amazing group of 
international like documentarians who wanted to create independent journalism and they wanted to figure out how to use tools like the new emerging tools of digital video and online video to document things that were not being documented. So my interest as a printmaker slowly shifted to video. And I've tried to maintain like a balance between the two. But when I, you know, 20 years ago was exactly when um, we had Bush versus Gore. And I felt so disconnected from my own country that I, I made it a purpose to come back, refocus on printmaking, but also look at journalism. And then, you know, after September 11th, um, I just felt I had to stay. I had to stay here and I had to really push the medium of, of learning how to be more of a videographer and more like a video artist and printmaker. So I've spent the last 20 years trying to merge those, those ideas. And um, one thing that I think is really essential is that the, the printmaking process is still stuff I use today in my work. I often think about what's the image that I capture how do I, what's the best kind of technique to use for that? Just like I would if I was thinking of using photo etch or an etch-in or a lithograph. Um, and then where it goes. And the main thing that I think that really, I, I, I really tried to learn, I'm still learning to this day is how do I then share those images to the rest of the world? And I think that's where, um, that's helped me a lot with kind of the projections we do now. Cause it, you know, it goes from an idea to a process to there. Um, now, now talking about it, it seems like a very quick transition from a printmaker to a projection artist, but that's, that's basically how it began. But in other words, then you are self-trained in video production or? Uh, pretty much. I mean, it's interesting because I, I, you know, I read a lot about like, like Renaissance art and, and about the kind of apprenticeship models. Mm -hmm. So I really tried to find mentors and, you know, just like with printmaking, Mike Platt was a ma massive mentor. He was an amazing Maze an artist, and he was a mentor to so many artists in Washington, D.C. Um, and so I looked for those same kind of mentors in, in the video world and video artists and, and, and filmmakers. Um, and I think for most of my career, I help out other people. You know, a lot of times I work as an editor, editor a cinematographer, even produce or direct other people's pieces. You know, and I think that, you know, I've learned it by doing it. You know, the, you know I mean, now I even teach video. But when I first started out, there wasn't, you know, there wasn't really a manual for how do you be, how do you do video projection mapping or, you know, we're like, we've, I've been working with certain software since version one of that software. And now we're on version, you know, 10, you know, it's been a wild process of like learning as we go. And now what we see is your um, Mount Pleasant studio, right? With how many monitors, 12 monitors? Yeah, right now yeah, it's 12 or 13. Um, and they're not all up. I mean, we did a, an exhibit uh, last year uh, called Arcade. We had over 20 monitors up at once. Um, and, you know, it's, it's interesting because when you have stuff, when you're used to projecting stuff really big, you try to, it's interesting how you have to cheat the eye to visualize it when you're in the studio. Because, you know, we're, you know, the space is about 10 feet by 10 feet, maybe a little bit bigger. But, you know, when I'm, on a, when I'm projecting on a building or if I'm in like a space like the Corcoran, it's so much bigger. So, so the way I kind of cheat it is by setting up different monitors in different places so I can start to get a feel for what the immersive feel is. Mm -hmm. So I don't usually think about it until someone else comes in and they're like, wow, that's a lot of computers. So that's a lot of monitors. Um, I will say a secret to all the students out there, please use your school or library's computers because when I first started out, the computers were so slow, I would literally walk in after hours and I'd use eight computers at a time. I would work on one, render it, it would take you know, an hour or two, then I'd jump on another one. And so I literally would use like six to eight computers at once because they just weren't fast enough. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I, it does look a little bit like a Namjoon type or like Matt's headroom in here from time to time. I mean, so you mentioned earlier to me when we had a different conversation that your first projection in DC was 99 at Velvet Lounge. Velvet Lounge. So I'm sure some people would remember that play. Yeah, I mean, when we first started out doing projections, I mean, that was, a, that was a, an eye-opening moment for me was I knew that more, more people would pay attention to my work if it was a video that was behind a band or a DJ. Like, and, that, and I liked that kind of experience that someone would be, that would, they would view my work in an environment where they weren't forced to look at it, but it was part of an overall scene. 
so yeah, when we did we did our very first projection in DC at the Velvet Lounge in the upstairs, we built we got this piece of wood and we put it up there. And, and the piece of wood lasted was up there for like 10 years. It was like this map. I loved like showing up in the velvet and still seeing how we wedged this piece of wood that no one could reach. And that's where we put a projector. Um, and at that point, and this is how we kind of did it. Is we, I mean, at that time, I couldn't afford a projector. So I'd always borrow like a friend of mine who'd work in an office. I would show up to their office at like 5.30 in the afternoon on a Friday, sneak, go into the back, you know, into the alleyway, get a projector, we'd get it. And then we'd use it for a show. And then I'd have to deliver it back on Sunday night so that no one knew that we had taken it. Um, so yeah, back then, like the projectors were, it was super scary. Like we did not want them to get broken, but we just didn't have them. Uh, now we have a bunch of projectors, which is, we, we make a lot of trouble with. And so from then on, how does it, how did it evolve and became so elaborate from boring the projector to amassing projectors and working on outdoor facades and, and different yeah. buildings and projecting out of your studio. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, I mean, one of the things, I mean, the interesting thing is that I, I do think that my first outdoor projection that, that we could really talk about is we did this projection, uh, uh, we called it the Sorry State of the Union. We projected the, the State of the Union outside of the State of the Union in 2003 with a bunch of bands. Um, and we had like Mr. Lift, uh, Fevery Corporation was there, Mile Marker, it was a bunch of bands. It was, it was an amazing kind of freezing cold show. It was like 20 degrees outside. But we again rented, a, we borrowed a projector. My best friend, Dave Anderson, helped me build a screen that we got, we got the largest screen that we could rent in DC. The rental company broke it the morning of the show. And my friend rebuilt this entire screen in front on the National Mall in front of the Capitol. And yeah, we did this massive projection. Um, and when we first started out, it was all singular projections. We used one piece of software. I'd have a couple of VCRs. I remember when we felt really fancy when we finally had like a DVD player. And then when we incorporated computers into it, it was like next level. Um, but you know, it really wasn't until almost 10 years later. That the, that the technology just kind of caught up with what we were trying to do, which was project on the streets. And so we started figuring out ways to mobily do these shows. Because part of the, I mean, for me still like the biggest joy of doing the projections is when someone walks down the street and they're not expecting to see it and they see it in a very site specific place on the building where it's happening. And, they don't hear us, they don't, and they, they just see it happening and they, it's a surprise. So, you know, so we, you know, started in 2013, 2014, we really started being able to be on the street because of just the, the higher lumen projectors were, you know, at a, at a level that we could actually carry them around. I mean, one of the projectors used to take, I mean, the bigger projectors, I remember once it took five people to carry it. It was like 200 pounds. And that same kind of, like scale projector now, I can get that weighs about 20 pounds and it's a fraction of the cost. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And in, in order to do that, did you have to have a permit or it was all like kind of guerrilla stuff, unplanned, invasive? I mean, I'm, I'm a firm believer that every projection is just a little different. And every, in, and in be, being in Washington, DC, we have so many different law enforcements yeah. and, and different places. And what we found out was, it really depended on exactly the square foot or the place we were actually standing. Like, I, I remember being once yelled at by this police officer saying, you can't be here. He was just so angry at me. And I thought I was going to get murdered. Um, and, and I was like, but where can I be? And he points. He points four feet away from where I'm standing. He's like, if you're there, you're not my problem. And so I moved my equipment over four feet. And he's like, that's fine. And I was like, that was it. Now, we've had other problems um but it really is a, mi a mix i mean we we did you know we really did try to find how we could do this legally and and you know what most of the time it is legal like it was but it was figuring out how to do it and then it's also kind of the um you know it's different different time periods you know, you, you know it's really hard to explain physics and 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 like photons with 
police officers at 11 o'clock at night. So it's a lot of times picking your quick picking your battle. Like, so if they say you got to stop, you're like, yeah, we're going to stop. But you know, at the same time, we've we've done it enough now. It's become a thing. And now, I mean, I, I once said we had a time with a, a problem with a police officer, and I said, listen, this is legal. And the Washington Post wrote an article about why it's legal. Hmm. Um, but the, it's you know, it, to start out, it was it was it was not easy. Hmm. Um, you know, one thing, yeah, I mean, one thing I, I can definitely say is that the, the kind of like going back to the printmaking, it really did teach me the whole idea of process and then figuring out the stages of the project. And so that once, once I have an idea and then once it becomes a thing and then once the medium, I then can, I really then start to really focus once I'm on location on what I'm trying to say and how it fits into the building. And, um, so it does start with an idea and then oh, yeah. goes into the space. And it's funny enough, some of the ideas, you know, sometimes they just snap and other times they take months to years to work. And even if it's a text-based idea, you know, there's times that we've, you know, I've had a few projections that, you know, by the time I've, I've done the actual projection, I, I've been thinking about it for over a year or two. Um, and some of the, some of you know, and, the, and on the flip side, there's been a few that like literally, like the one that's behind me right now, which is the expert. You want to show us a little bit of snippets? Yeah, let me let me show that to you. And everyone at home, I I prepared for tonight so I can show it. So I'm just going to jump the full screen. Like, boom! <laughs> this was the very first projection that we did uh, at, at the Trump Hotel, and that was in 2016. Um, and that was a play on uh, a, a punk rock campaign uh, called Experts Agree Niece of the Pig, which is about the Attorney General under Reagan. And so we thought it'd be funny to write Experts Agree Trump is a Pig. So it's a play, it's a play on the actual, um, uh, on that saying. And um, it's a perfect segue to say like, I, I, I made a film after I got arrested. You know, I won this, uh, uh, basically, I joined this class action lawsuit against the DC police and the DC government for being falsely arrested at this, you know, for filming at this protest. Um, and I got a settlement. And I thought the only best way to use the money from that was to make this film uh, about this punk rock organization called Positive Force, which they do these amazing benefit shows. And they've been doing it for over 30 years. Um, and so for me, it was a really great time to kind of look at art and activism and look at how art can kind of coexist within a community. It was such a great example. And so I spent five years of my life making a film about this group. Um, I even have a uh, poster from that, which I highly recommend everybody um, check, it, check it out when they have a chance. Um, here we go. Um, and one of the interesting things about the, the film is we, we ended up making the film like a benefit, benefit uh, show. So all the proceeds from the film actually go to the group Positive Force and We Are Family that's still doing uh, food delivery today for, for low-income seniors in the, in the DC area, focused primarily in Columbia Heights. Um, so if you are looking for something really good to do local uh, and support local groups, uh, We Are Family and Positive Force or just it's a really amazing thing it's cool to think that this film that we made if someone buys the copy online that goes the, the proceeds from that go to the go to families in need right now um but you know i think that was one of the the things i tried to figure out with all my work is how it connects um and and and, and you know somehow use the work to i don't know i when it, when it has that connection, I feel better. And so I, I've been trying to learn about it. And so that, that project in particular, I learned a lot about just how people can use their work to make things better. And so I, I guess that's why it's so good that that was the first projection on the Trump Hotel was that connection uh, with, with that. But when we were talking earlier, you said what's important to you is the community space. Yeah, and you know what, what's interesting to me the comment you, you made at the very beginning why printmaking because you can share it because it's a multiple that can be distributed and disseminated to all and it's more democratic in that sense and 
similarly, projections are democratic because they enter the public space and mm -hmm. they invade the public space uh, with invitation or without invitation and, and they are to be shared. So that's where the, the, the past and the present comes together. It, it, exactly. Like I had this fear of like, you know, I have some friends of mine who are amazing painters. And, you know, the scary thing I think for, for a lot of painters is that they work on a piece and it's this great piece of work and it will only live in one person's home. Mm -hmm. Or it could, get, it could get picked up by a museum, but it might be in a basement most of its life as opposed to being out, out there. Um, and so I love the idea that like, yeah, you know, now, now it's strange because it's almost this extreme now where I don't even own the projections. <laughs> like they're, they're so temporary. They're only up for moments of time. And then they really live now in like photographs and you know, digital data that are on the cloud. Like, it's not like I, you know, with the prints, I actually had like a piece of paper and I didn't need to worry about electricity. Well, I, mean, they, I love them both. Yeah, they, they work both ways yeah. in a different way. In a different way. So that so from Trump onwards, from the hotel, that probably that projection made you, shall I say, famous it's, or well known, or established. It's funny because you know, like we we did, you know, with the with the with the film that came out in two thousand fourteen, we we you know we, we already kind of like we're building something. But yeah, I mean, the first Trump hotel projection we got, we got a couple articles about it, um, and we were doing projections on different spaces. Um, uh, Kristen Capps, I think, Pro City Lab, the Atlantic wrote a piece about the experts agree. Um, but the the big the big kind of one was actually like the fifth or sixth time we were at the Trump Hotel, where we did pay Trump bribes here, and that like let me show you that one. I think most people might from home might know this one, but this was this was one that we did. Um, you know, we where we projected about the emoluments clause, and. And you know, it's like pay Trump scribes here. And so it was a visualization of something that was really hard to visualize, which was that basically foreign governments were renting out the Trump Hotel so that they could get access to, to, to Trump. You know, so if they paid money for the hotel, they could get closer to closer access. Um, so yeah, so this was this one was like, you know, we got some notoriety from the previous projections, but this one was bananas. I mean, this one went full on uh, viral. Um, we ended up, you know, millions, millions of views. You know, I, I ended up doing 24 interviews in 24 hours. Um, I think one of my favorite articles written about me uh, by, in, in the LA Times was, I did an interview at 3.30 in the morning <laughs> for an hour, but it was like this, this energy behind it. Um, and I think part of it was also, I mean, that period of time was really depressing. I mean, we were just the very beginning of the Trump presidency and things were happening that, you know, it, it just seemed so important to, to create art. I mean, I know for, for, for myself and, and I had conversations with other artists um, about this, which is that we felt that we had failed as artists to truly visualize how bad a Trump presidency could be and, and what kind of losses we were gonna have as a civilization. And, and, I, and I firmly believe that artists um, and, and did a really good job post-Trump trying to, to show what was going on. And I, and I think that there was this amazing amount of activism from the Women's March on to really um, to combat some of the worst things of Trumpism. But I think that the work that we did was a part of that kind of visualization of something that was hard to visualize. Um, at the same time, it was this kind of like cathartic, like, but we're we're putting this right on the building where it's happening. Um, you know, I, I tell you when we did it, the, the one thing that I'll, I'll never forget when we were in the studio and we, you know, put it on the wall and I saw it and it made me laugh. So it made a situation where you felt very hopeless. And you're like, you know, we're 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 in for a real, you know, as they'd say when they were a kid, a cruising for a bruising. We we just thought it was gonna be a really, and it was a really tough four years. But the, the projections for us personally helped us get through that period. And I, and I think that they really helped other people. And so, so like for the people who are out there, um, and especially now with, with the stuff that's going on with COVID and how we're disconnected, any work that we can create that can create these communities and kind of create a conversation that crosses um, really helps. 
and, and you know that's yeah that's that's kind of how you know looking back on the trump hotel projections i'm i'm excited not to project on the trump hotel <laughs> but that on, on a positive end for you that led to other invitations from different cities right to do projects outside so in that sense it was a positive experience for you it led to to different things yeah i mean it, I, I was talking to a friend of mine today who's a social worker and she said well now business is booming it's not always a good thing you know yeah. it's, it's it's an interesting like i mean if i you know with the work i want to create i i I, I don't I, I I felt the need that I had to do a lot of these projections because I, I felt like it wasn't being said it had to be said and I couldn't sleep right if I did it and I think right after the election in 2016 I couldn't sleep and I just was not as waking up and I just was having this worst nightmares and as soon as I started really working hard on some of the projections I started to feel better and I noticed other people were feeling better. And I just kind of rode that energy. Um, at the same time, like I, I, I like to think that though, that's because it's the work that was happening. And you know, I not to and I'm not at all comparing myself to Picasso, but Picasso was, you know, did Guernica. And Guernica is this amazing piece. I think he would have rather not done that piece, but he had to do that piece because of the bombing. Dealing with the yeah. reality. The reality. So I think that, you know, I think for myself and a lot, a lot of artists out there, we've been, we've been tackling these issues because it's, it's what's right in front of us. And, and we think that we, it, it helps us process it, but then we also know that, yeah, th there is almost like a civil, a civic responsibility of not ignoring what's right in front of us with our work. At this, at the same time, you know, I, I, you know, there's a lot of other kind of work I want to create. Like, I think like last year, a good example of that was Arcade. We did this piece about, you know, which is my love of games and my love of like community. I'm going to show you. you a have, yeah. That. Can you show us a little bit? Yeah. Let me show you that. So this was like, this like fun thing. I mean, I love, you know, this is like where we're, we were trying to examine how people would play games um, in a public space. Because you know now everyone has their cell phones, so these are all like pre cell phone. All the games are from before two thousand, um, and we did this as part of the Fringe Festival. And yeah, we set up like twenty monitors, and we had, um, you know, it was fun. And for me personally, as an artist, like after spending three years at that point dealing with just Trump, just to, to, to hang out with people, people who didn't even know any of my projection work. Like some people would even come up to me like, oh, these projections are cool, but have you seen those ones in the Trump Hotel? I'm like, oh really, tell me about them. But it's like, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was, you know, there's some, some, some work I really. Uh -oh. I think Rob, Robin, are you there? I think we might have lost him. He's still connected. But Maybe we he's lost him. frozen. I'm gonna text him. Okay. And I we apologize for this glitch. There's always a text surprise. Um, Just give us one moment. This is the uh, the curse of um, working through working through uh, Zoom right now. So give us one second, everyone.
Well, if, I was going to say, if anyone has any questions that they would like yeah. to ask Robin when he gets back online, now is the time to throw those into the Q&A or into the chat for us. As I just sent a message to all in the chat, um, Zoom just crashed uh, on his end. So he's going to restart a computer and join us again. This is what happening to the computer person. So uh, just bear with us. And um, if you have any questions for me, <laughs> I'm here. My computer still hasn't crashed, but can. Or. Yes, I think so. I know Robin did a project with the Phillips collection or an artist who was showing at the Phillips collection a little bit ago. Yes, I mean, he, he he's going to, I was going to ask him that uh, some years ago, maybe 10 years ago or something like that, um, he took a part and here he is and then um, hey, uh, but there we go. Thank you. We are so, back. Um, I, 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 I'm just going to have to throw some shade at Comcast. Um, the internet just went down. This has never happened to us before. I'm so embarrassed. So I apologize to no, everybody. Please. Um, but we need Comcast to not do that. All right. Sorry. Enough. It happens. But um, yeah, so I think we were talking about the arcade and then uh, correct me. Yeah. And games. And games. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, it, it a long story short. Like, I, I mean, I think one of the things that makes me happy when we do projections is having some form of fun. And I think that um, that's, I think part of the reason, and also just enjoying life, you know, and I think that that's a big, a, you know, I think that's why also we fight so hard against people like Donald Trump is that he's not a funny person. He doesn't have a sense of humor and he's really cruel. And I, I, I really want to help propel people who are positive and knock down people who are like negative. Um, and I think that's why some of my early video work that I did was very much about um, trying to show systems of people trying to do great things. Like I had the honor of going to India with uh, Dr. Bronner's uh, Magic Soaps and they make uh, organic fair trade soap. Um, and so I got to go to different countries where their soap is actually made and film these like amazing like fair trade cooperatives that were real, like where they were actually, where the goods that you produce actually help the communities where they come from. And so I did, you know, for two years, I spent, you know, my life just going to these places and making films about the, that process. Like one of, the, one of the films I'm really proud of is this piece I did about uh, olive oil that they use. Um, they use Palestinian and Israeli farmers to produce the olive oil. Like, so, you know, it's, it's interesting what you get known for. And I, I'm hoping that, you know, now, now with, you know, I, I still think we have, so much work to do. I mean, even with Trump being gone, I don't think we're going to run out of issues that we need to do projection protests around. But I think now we might be in a situation where we might have people who might listen better to the critique. That was a fly. That's not me losing my mind. The fly actually flew by me. Um, anyways, we, we have this uh, moment of, you know, I think the challenge now is it's, it's going to be a lot harder to visualize when you don't have something so easy. And, but I'm actually feel pretty comfortable. I'd rather have that because yeah, I mean, I think we're just trying to create stuff now that makes people process the world and also see an option for doing better. You know, I don't know. I know that's pretty grand and I'm a little bit distracted because there was a fly in my ear and the internet just went down, but let me, uh, yeah, sorry about that. So, which makes me, uh or it makes me bring something else we talked about, and that is um, COVID, another situation that uh, got us all in a, in a, in place of some uncertainty, um, inequality, or uh, self reflection, social distancing, or physical distancing, I should say. We're still socializing. I think that term is to me actually in kind of strange because we are socializing in a different way, but we're desperately missing this direct communication that is physical communication. Yeah. So you went through COVID yourself I and did. which affected you personally and your work and mm -hmm. something good came out of it. Could you tell us about your experience, your personal and artistic and, and I'm, I'm alluding to sorry project that to me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I can, I can jump between the two. 
Um, you know, and, and, and you know, I mean, for, first off, like, um, th this has been a really hard, hard six months, you know, and it's longer now. Now we're almost at nine months at this point. Um, I got COVID really early on. Um, I kind of was in denial about it, <laughs> um, about how bad it was. And, 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 um, you know, I, I, one of those people that got, you know, they, I guess they call like a long hauler. So I still to this day have certain symptoms. And in, you know, so I got it in March, April. And um, that, that's when it was really bad, but it shifted my practice, you know? So I ended up in this weird process where I was, I was just physically exhausted. Um, and, you know, we, we um, I, I knew that at that point, the, the projections were more essential than ever. Um, and it's interesting, I actually have a video, I'm gonna show why I talk about this, just because I feel it's, it's essential. Um, we, we, we started just projecting outside of the apartment that I was living in, the window from there. So at that time, I was still pretty sick. Um, you know, but we, I, I, there's a, a nice uh, artist and, and activist in, in Austin, Texas, Duncan Meisel, and he reached out to me about his COVID memorial project. Um, which where he was collecting, uh, Im he was basically collecting photographs and statements from people who had lost their family members. Um, and what's crazy is, you know, when we did our first projection, it was 35,000 people. And, you know, when we're, we're approaching 300,000 now, um, you know, I mean, and, you know, the, the, the great thing is with projections is we can still pull them off, usually in a socially distanced way or uh, physically distanced way. Um, but, you know, I mean, I'll be honest, I, I, there was a brief period of time I didn't think I was going to make it. Um, and having that kind of moment, um, you know, when you get better from it, it also creates a certain level of energy of like urgency. And so I feel like the last like nine months, we've been working in overdrive, especially with the election to, um, you know, connect as many dots as possible. Um, you know, and one of the things that we had planned before COVID, um, I, I, I work with this, collaborate with this amazing artist um, whose name I'm going to mispronounce, and I apologize ahead of time, Monica, Monica Johan Bas, um, and I'm mispronouncing her last name, and but she's an amazing, amazing artist, and she's been working on these sorry projects, and so we um, we got a grant from the DC government from the DC Commission of Arts and Humanities. Um, to do a project on Earth Day, which was making these uh, saris and then projecting on them. Um, and so we, um, we had this project scheduled to go on, on, on at Georgetown for the week, weekend of Earth Day. Um, but because of, of COVID, we had to shut it down. And so on actually Earth Day, we, we did a kind of a Zoom thing. And then uh, in Ju July, we did this, we, we redid the projection, but we were able to do it with you know, distance and, and still show these. Um, and I think that's like the thing is no matter what's going on, we still have, um, you know, we're going to get through COVID. It's going to, it's going to hurt. A lot of people are going to suffer. Um, but I, I have, I have confidence that, you know, as a planet, we're going to come together. Um, but we, we really have to come together as far as the climate crisis. And so to work with Monica was amazing to, connect the dots between, you know, we, had, we had folks in Bangladesh and folks in, in Washington, DC work together on the same saris. And then there was documentation from that project um, that then we took that and then we created video collages. And then, you know, I'm, I'm super stoked about how it looked, how it felt, um, you, know, you know, it was just, it created a, these moments outside. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how many days? How many days this was going on for? Uh, we did that for the three nights of projections. Yeah, yeah. I think there's like three three nights of projections. Um, you know, the Georgetown bid was great. They they came in and gave us a space. Um, you know, we've done some cool light installations with them with Glow, uh, which is also a really great um, outdoor like light and projection festival that happens once a year. Um, but it's really great to be, you know, for a lot of people for this, this, this thing, it was their first time they'd gone outside in a long time for more of the, just to check out art. Um, I was, I was super, super proud of that. Um, you know, we're going to do another, we got another grant. So we're going to be doing another project next year. 
Um, you know, do you want to tell us? Yeah, I'm that one. I'm 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 a, just I'm just gonna let you know it's gonna be somewhere in Adams Morgan. It'll be there'll be the, the community aspect, and Monica and I are gonna come up with something pretty fun. Um, it's it's interesting because you know where you're you're you know having these projects, it's helped us kind of move. You know, we're still focused on the crimes of Trump and all these things that are going on. At the same time, we're trying to think, you know, broader. You know about what's what's up ahead and. Um, you know, at the same time, you know, I wanted, I definitely wanted to mention the library project. You know, yeah. as you mentioned earlier, you know, what, what Which I is love still on you. It's so still people on you. Um, but, you know, we're, we're technically the, like the artist in residency until the end of February. So uh, I'm running a little bit late for the next version of it, but there will, there's a current video that's up and then I'm going to redo, uh, make another video that that's going to come up in the next few weeks. Let's, uh, let's see some, some footage. Yeah. I'm really happy about this. So tell us about it. It's thematic. It was a commission. And here we go. Yeah. And so this this is the first one. And this is we got um, it was it, it launched during the March on Washington. And so what we did is we, we got all this like really great archival footage and we 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 matched it with footage from today with, you know, the movement for black lives and, and, the, and the protests that have happened over the summer, you know, these kind of connections and messages and um, it, it's, 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 it's really been awesome. Like, and yeah, this is an installation that you can see um, as long as it's dark outside um, at 9th and G. Um, and, but we're going, through the, we're going through the archive of the, of the library. Um, and some of these images were from the, for the National Archives, mm -hmm. um, which is an interesting thing. Like when I first started out doing video, that was my first professional job in video was searching the National Archives looking for footage. So I was kind of excited to kind of bring that process in, but it's, I think that's like, if there was like one overwhelming theme of my work is, is that I'm trying to examine the past, the present and the future and how they're, and how they're interconnected. Um, so this, this has been a really fun piece. Um, and I mean, the video is cool, but I think when you see it in person, the, what I really love about this piece is how it, um, it just the, the 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 texture of the screen and the way it like it, the information flows and how you see it and you can see it um, you know from halfway down the street it's, so I, I anyone in Washington D.C. Uh, please come and check it out you know so I want to thank the D.C. Library and the D.C. Library uh, uh, Foundation for really being supportive and and doing it's it's great to work with other people and I think that's the strength of, of everything and it's up until midnight or something like that or you don't know oh uh, well no we, we we set it to like i think what five in the morning, in the morning? Yeah. yeah it's we, we wanna, you know i i i love you know I, I still have like the night owl in me where you know from like back when i was like younger and i do things in clubs but i love the idea that you know someone could leave a bar at two in the morning and they see it and they, they have a moment you know they have a moment with the art mm -hmm. that they're not expecting and i think that's one of the you know we have this one photo series in there and uh there was a young man who was arrested uh, over the summer uh, at, at a Black Lives Matter protest. And there's a photo of him there. And he had this moment where I come up there and he's standing there staring at himself on the screen. And, and it was, it was and, and for me, there was a, you know, a connection of like, I, was, I could literally say I've been there. And then, and I saw like his, you know, he, he was processing that moment because it is like a betrayal when you don't do anything wrong and you're arrested. And, and, you know, like having that moment, that connection, that time with him just to say like, hey, this happens, but we have, you have your whole life to work towards. And I think that was the thing that was exciting about that was, you know, I'm not super young, I'm not super old. He's super young. And then we're looking at footage that's 50 years old and footage from today. And knowing that we're part of, we're in the history that's happening and the way in which we act can make it better or worse, depending on um, our action or inactions. So this was the first in the series, from what I understand. So yeah. uh, what is the next one? The, the next one we're working on is imagery from 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 now the the library. Um, there's they have this great I mean, the website. I mean, what we're really fortunate the, the DC library is one of the coolest libraries in the country. They do really great work with service with the community. Um, you know, a lot of libraries are, they're hubs, they're, they're places where people come for service and for, you know, you know, 
to, to you know for self improvement and sometimes as simple as just an internet connection. Um, so they did a series on of basically life in Washington D.C. under COVID. So I'm working with imagery of, from that. Um, that that I'm also working on something that I'm going to release probably closer to January, which is more about the architecture. Um, you know this this is uh, a me, uh, I'm going to mispronounce his name, Mies van der Rohe, the yeah. architect. Um, it's, it's amazing. The, the physical building is amazing. So this, I, you know, in this process of working on this projection, I've been learning more about modernist architecture, about kind of the, of how it was used for trying to be utilitarian. Um, and it's, yeah, so, so, you know, some of it's a little more abstract and some of more of it's literal, but it all draws from the archive, the library, and then the physical building itself. It's a video collage, in other words. Yeah, I, I I love, you know, I can't leave without saying this is the same thing I did at the court at the Phillips collection 10 years ago when I did the Kandinsky show. And I'm just going to show a fraction of that, um, which is one of my favorite things I worked on. It's you, the, the Phillips collection gave me access to the show. And so I filmed it and I made my own kind of video collage with this material. Uh, I might fast forward it because um, I think our, a mutual friend of ours that we love. Bala. It was another project to the Phillips, yes, that she, you produced, yeah. And it was it was amazing to watch, you know, to, to, to have him talk about his structure that he built and then to film it. And I'll, I'll never forget because my camera overheated, like it melted like three times while filming this thing. Um, but yeah, it was really great. Like I love kind of documenting other people's work and kind of talking with them about it and then kind of making something that's not just a video, but it's more like a video that you would interact with or a video that would be up in like an environment. So we we did this at one of the Phillips After Fives. Um, this was, I think, almost 10 years ago, and this is how we met. Yep, and yeah, yeah, yeah but he, he made an amazing meal and, uh, and he brought us <laughs> over. And I, I, mean, it, I mean, I do have to say like, for me, I, one of my life goals was to have some kind of interaction with the Phillips collection, like just like we're doing now. I mean, being an artist from Washington, D.C., um, you know, we're D.C. is sometimes a place where people don't think artists live. They think it's a government town. And I feel very lucky that I'm part of a community of artists, musicians, activists, and people who just care and are empathetic. And the, the Phillips collection has this amazing collection. Um, but the thing that, you know, it, it's a live-in museum and, you know, with the history of it starting, you know, a hundred years ago um, as, as a reaction to the Spanish influenza with Duncan Phillips's brother and father passing away and, you know, creating this idea of a live-in museum. The thing that I loved about it, like, and I really, I can't stress how important it is, is how the collection moves and it shifts and, and the work that you all brought in, you know, especially with the intersections project. I mean, I, I remember, I love this, like this, uh, Lynn Myers did this, this, the just drawing. And I, I remember once like going there and watching her do it and I snapped a picture. Um, I got in trouble for it actually, the security guard was upset. But, but, but I gave it to Lynn and she was, it was and I think it ended up getting used at one point. And I was like, but it's a living museum. You know, it's, it's really, um, you know, it's, there's something, you know, for, you know, for people like we're looking forward to getting back to being in that space. I mean, I, you're open now and I'm looking forward to coming back, um, but it's it's such a treasure, um, you know, and you, you know, you just really, it's the, the people who work in the museum, um, you know, everybody, you know, yourself, Dorothy, like everyone in the, Alec, Bill, Layla, Laura, like all the people, like just a, they're really a great, um, I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm really, it's been, it's, I was really looking forward to talking to you and I'm really excited about kind of the future and how how the art, I mean, first off, Warm and Waters, or sorry, not Warm and Waters, uh, The Warmth of the Other Sun, I'm sorry, Warm and Waters was our own project, but The Warmth of the Other Sun, it's an amazing, the, the way you all put that show together, um, the Zilla show, I'm mispronouncing her name. Zilla. I loved how you, you did that. Like, it was such an, a powerful um, thing. So, you know, I, 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 I didn't want to like, Lee without definitely saying that. And, you know, the, the connection with the Phillips for me was like my great uncle is a painter and uh, Leland Bell, and he's he's in the collection. And he was, you know, 
a troublemaker in DC when he was a young kid. And he'd actually go to the museum and sketch. He'd skip school and go to the Phillips collection and sketch and do work. Um, and, and, and so like I'd heard these stories about him like skipping school and going to the museum, him skipping school and he was a drummer and he'd play with like different DC musicians and stuff. And, and so for, you know, the first 10 years of my studio, I had a big poster of his work from his show at the, at the Phillips collection. So, um, you know, it, the, the place is a very special place in, in my heart. Um, and I'm just so happy, you know, I'm happy to be here and I just can't wait to see what, what comes next. Thank, thank you for being generous and thank you for being part of the family and stay on. And I think I'm being mindful of time and I'm sure people would wanna ask questions. I wanna ask you many more questions, but I would like to, um, there was one question in the chat. So guys, please feel free to send your question in Q and A or chat. Uh, there was one question that I wanted to address and then I'll ask some of, some of the others. Um, uh, let me just go back. Uh, how would you place your work among traditions of graffiti subculture and how does the street art community react to your work? I thought it was a very interesting question that I also wanted to ask. So maybe you can speak to that a little bit. First off, I, I have a lot of respect for the street art community. I mean, I think my work is, um, it, it somehow fits into it, but I think with, with, with a lot of the, I, I think the graffiti artists and especially the painters, they, they put a lot, they risk a lot more than I do um, to do their work. And it's, it's really hard to do what they do. I think there's a, there's a somewhat of a, a, a symbiotic and a respect. Um, you know, I, I've, for a little bit, I would also project for street artists where I like would project something and then they would stencil it out. So I would you know, go to a location, do a projection and then they come and do the actual painting. Um, you know, they're, they're you know, there, there's definitely a connection, um, but I don't know. What I'm, what I'm trying to say is, I, I wouldn't call. I I feel like there's something special about what they do that I couldn't take complete. I, I can't say that I'm doing what they're doing, but it's it's just a medium. You never know. I might have done some graffiti at some point. I don't know. Yeah. One thing we didn't talk about, uh, maybe this is a moment as we're waiting for questions. We didn't talk about your film, uh, uh, your documentary, your feature length film about punk culture, which is very much part of the city and which goes back to the community and, you know, mm -hmm. art and activism, which is such an underlying premise of your work, all of your work mm -hmm. from obviously from the beginning to now and to, you know, to, to come. Um, and some of the members of the Phillips were part of that punk scene. Mm -hmm. So you worked on that film a long time and it's um, available on Amazon Prime. Yeah, you can get a video, Amazon Prime, uh, PM Press, which, you know, we we ended up, yeah, this was a benefit film. So if you, if you get it from PM Press, um, more of the money goes to them. So how they recommend it. Also, if anyone- Better than Amazon. Yeah, I mean, a Amazon, I, to be honest, I didn't know it was on Amazon until I was watching the Borat film. And then it went to like, it took, if you like this, you might like this film oh, and it's like my own film. I was like, okay, that's interesting. Uh, <laughs> You know me tell, well. Tell us about it. I mean, the whole idea, the positive force. Um, yeah. I think a lot of what you do is about positive force or reinforcement. Yeah. Positive it's, reinforcement. It's interesting because like, I, I definitely learned a lot about, about how I handle my own business and how I handle kind of the approach of, as a filmmaker, as an artist from the punk rock scene in this kind of idea of do it yourself. You know, one of the things that, you know, I mean, stylistically, my work is different. You know, I, I, I would say if anything, I came more from like electronic music, um, you know, some rock and roll, some punk, some hip hop stuff, but more like more like classical or electronic stuff. Um, but the one thing was really about like accountability, about, about, you know, ideas of space, the punk rock community in DC, they use like church basements, community centers for venues, not nightclubs. Um, they were all ages, they were inclusive. Um, you know, they really, they were trying to like challenge the system and are continuing to challenge the system. You know, the interesting thing with the, with the film is, you know, the group is now, now at this point, 35 years old. So you have people who are like movers and shakers who's now their kids are the people who are now putting on shows and, and, and are doing the bands. Um, so it really is this amazing community um, and it's my neighbors. And I think that, 
you know, I started working on this, the film right after I had gone to India to film with, with Dr. Bronner's. And, uh, and part of it was, you know, a lot of filmmakers I knew were going to other countries to make things. And I, and I thought, you know, I have a community in my own neighborhood. Um, and I will say it's, it's really challenging to make a film in your own neighborhood. Because when you make a film about someone far away, they don't know you're working on it. It's another thing when you're working on a film and the people who are in your movie are walking across the street from you every day. And they, they hold you to account, you know? They're also like, you walk down and you see them at the coffee shop and like, so how's the film coming? You, you know, and you also like, it also created a really interesting vetting process of the film. Like we, we filmed it over five years. We did the primary film in over two years, but we also had this moment where we would show people things and then they would react to it. You know, and we really, um, I'm really proud of that film. I mean, I can't, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm biased, but I think, I really think, you know, anyone who really wants to know more about punk rock and activism and know about the DC music scene, I think it's a really, I'm, I'm yeah, I'm really, I really stand behind it. Um, and it's a benefit. And I think that's also what made it really easier to work on the film, you know, with the people knew my intention. I was very, you know, I was, I was like, you know, with everything I do now, I'm trying to learn as I work on things, you know, and I really feel like, um, you know, I, 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 this semester, I, I was, is really an honor. I got to work with Maida Withers uh, and Ludovic um, at GW helping dance students who were, normally would have a show and they we helped them with the video. And, and so like, and what I'm, what I'm taking a long time saying is like, I really think that part of my process is constantly trying to learn new technology and learning how that interacts with people and, and and somehow trying to like connect the dots. Oh shoot, I need to show one other thing. Community. So in the studio next to me is my partner in crime, Sarana Yamahira, who is so smart to say, I need to talk about open before we go. Cause that's where I met me. I was gonna ask you about that too. Don't worry. Uh, but yeah, I, I wanna give chance to people to ask questions. This is Corcoran. Right. Yep. Yeah. These were like these were like these big big statues, and these were repurposed cubes that were already in the space. And these were the these were the dancers performing the the dance students, uh, and and uh, performing in the sculpture itself. Um, we did this really great open and enclosing events, um, and it was really you know again it's, it's it's about community you know and bringing people together. It's with these amazing dancers. Um, we had this project called Boat Burning, um, which was 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 a, a beautiful project. Um, the 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 guy who who was who who's instrumental in the address, um, who who we were collaborating with, passed away about two months before the show opened, and we were a, we were able to still do the show with with the, with the guitarists, and it, I don't know, it was it, this kind of connect this. That project really connected a lot of dots, which was this kind of time period that we were at with, you know, with this administration, my own history of, you know, I used to teach at the Corcoran and my like, and, and then, you know, looking at the history of the Corcoran with the cancellation of the Robert Maplethorpe show. Um, when we started working on the show, the government was actually shut down. So it's re it really surreal to walk, you know, we're setting up a show at the Corcoran across the street from the White House called open in the middle of a government shutdown. Um, and then, you know, having, having a, a collaborator pass away right before a show, um, you know, I, I was really, um, it, was, it was a tough time, but it really showed how community kind of came together. And it was sort of really, you know, the musicians, the dancers and the artists we worked with, it really, um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I wanna do that show again. I'd love to bring that somewhere else like into another part of the country. I know, yeah, we love that sign open and also kind of how it reflects the closing of the Maple Twerp and almost like reopen it again. And because the exhibition was done in commemoration of the closing of the show, but also alluding to open-minded, being open-minded or opening the borders or opening the discussion or opening, the city or opening the communities, all this kind of metaphorical meaning that 
the word open carries what is was beautiful it, it, it was a really amazing concept to play with um and and one of the things was that yeah i mean i i do think that that's you know it's that that was a great thing about working like with the dancers and watching how they interpreted the art and then watching the the musicians how they interpreted it and i think that's part of the process of what we try to maintain with the work i do is I try to keep an open mind with whatever the subject that we're trying to document and then also an open idea of what it should look like you know and not always not always saying it needs to look one way or the other um yeah I, i'd love to um i know i could ramble so i want to make sure that i'm not i'm, I'm answering yeah, so i want to read one question right. okay Ma. um how much of difference of understanding do you think there is between viewing one of your works in person compare just to a still? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, it's interesting because, in, <laughs> I hate to say it, sometimes they look better on camera than they look like in real person. Like, and they have different qualities. I mean, I do think that, um, the one thing is when you see it, when you see it in person, there's usually some form of conversation and a little bit more time spent on it. Whereas then when you see it online, um, you kind of have a certain time period that you'll look at it. It gets more into the kind of how you would look at a piece in a gallery or a museum or an Instagram. Um, it's kind of, you know, I think they, the, the, it's different. It's, um, and, and both have their own strengths and weaknesses. I think that uh, oftentimes, I mean, this, this is coming from me as the creator of these things. I prefer to look at them later on in the middle of the moment. I can't, I, I see it and I can, I can kind of appreciate it, but it's just like a pain. And if you're so close to it, you don't really enjoy it. Like the, the like the shots that like, you know, for me, like I, after, you know, Sora put together this edit of the open footage, I'm now really enjoying watching this right now. When I first saw it, I thought about, oh, why did I put that one color there? Why didn't I do this thing? Or why didn't I do that thing? And I'm not looking at the overall thing. And I think that's where, you know, because the pieces are oftentimes on very site specific places, like if we're projecting on the EPA, there is a certain weight to being physically there. Um, you know, unfortunately, like, or because of just how the world is, it's really cold right now. It's cold in DC. So I think it's a much more enjoyable process to, uh, to see the picture than it is to be outside. That being said, uh, we are doing a series of projections over the next three weeks in Arlington, uh, visual verse, where I'm actually projecting Poet Laureate's work in different spots uh, in Arlington. So we're actually outside for the next three weeks for three hours each Wednesday for the rest of the month. So how do we find out about it? Your Instagram? Um, uh, yes. And, and, and uh, if, you, if you type, vis if you Google or yeah. use your favorite search engine and, and search Robin Bell visual verse, in Arlington, um, you can come out and see it in person, and you can tell me whether or not I'm right or wrong about if it's better to see it, because we'll we'll post pictures, but then we'll also be there, um, bring something warm because it is cold. Yeah, it is certainly cold. And this brings me to the last question I have, and please, guys, feel free to ask question if if you have, because we're extending it from you a few more minutes. Trump is gone. So much of your work was about the era of his presidency. Now what? Um, that political activism is over somewhat, but there's so much more to be done, as you said to me the other day. Yeah. We're facing so many other issues, economic, environmental, um, lack unemployment. Uh, where is your work gonna take you in the next year or years to come? Anything um, on the horizon? Yeah, I mean, well, first off, I, I think, you know, I, I think Donald J. Trump might not be president after January 20th. I think, unfortunately, Trumpism um, and what it represented was there before he was in office, and it's maybe even stronger after he leaves. Um, so I think, I think some of our work is getting more complicated, and, and it's going to be harder. Um, I think there's, there's an you know, I, I mean, I think, you know, look, we, we're doing a lot of looking back 100 years, not just with the Phillips collection and, and the collection, but we're also looking back 100 years after World War One and after um, the Spanish 
in influenza and there was this, this thing out in Weimar journey, Germany about you know the great lie that Germany didn't lose World War I. And what, what Trump has set up in this country is this kind of denial of the election and denial of the vote. So I actually think that unfortunately our work, we're gonna, we're gonna I, I, I hate to say it, I'm gonna, I'm, it's gonna be a lifetime of work, you know, for better or for worse, because actually I love what I do. So I, and I think that sometimes we're able to shine a light on problems. So, so I, I think some of the most scary immediacy of, of things that would have happened with him didn't happen because people fought back. I mean, and I think that that's part of what I think our work does. You know, one of the projects that I, you know, I, I worked on this summer was this project called Remember What They Did, which was connecting artists with quotes. And one of the artists we worked with is a great artist, Swoon, and she made this piece called A Beautiful Picture. And it's a, it's a picture of, you know, Trump said a beautiful picture when he held up the Bible in front of the church, in front of the White House. And they used pepper spray, the military, military police and unidentified government agents attacked protesters on the streets. And, um, you know, people around the country stood stood up. You know, I actually have a video. Let me just, where, where, where is that, Sora? Oh, remember what they did? Oh, yeah, let me. So yeah, that's one of the things we did is we ended up doing a, 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 a billboard campaign around the country where we actually took quotes and I and I worked with other artists. And that's actually the piece right there that she, that, that she did. Let me go backwards on that. Um, um, but, you know, the thing that happened was that, that people actually stood up and they actually protested, they got out and voted. You know, we still have, even with Biden, we'll still have kids in jails. We, we have these systematic things that we need to work on. And the idea is that, you know, how do we keep that energy um, I don't, you know, COVID, this was a COVID related one that Nate Lewis made, who's an amazing artist from, from he lived in DC for a while. I got to give a shout out to Nate Lewis. Um, just a really amazing person. And he was, a, and he was a, you know, a, a, a healthcare worker. And so he made a piece about, about that. But I think the work, so the work in general, we, we have a, like, it's like a little bit of a reprieve. Like, I do think if Trump had gotten reelected, um, I actually think that my life and other people's my, lives would be more at threat. I think more journalists would get arrested. I think more people would be attacked. Yes. And, you know, I mean, I don't talk about it often, but, you know, there's a lot of people who don't like what I do. Um, and there's a lot of people who um, don't like art and they don't like democracy. And I think, I mean, so I think there, therefore we have, um, you know, we have our work cut out for us. Um, I'm hoping it's not as, as crazy as it was. And I think that time, I mean, that's where I think it's really important that we were able to do what we did and what we're doing is because I think right now we're collectively in a re really crazy time period. And we're gonna look back at the artwork. We're gonna look back at our culture 20, 30 years from now and go, I'm so glad we survived this, but that was really hard. I mean, you know, we were talking about COVID and, you know, I, I you know, you know, I, I have a family member who died during COVID and we didn't have, not from COVID, but we still haven't had a funeral because we can't meet in person. I have um, like so many people I know have lost people and they can't, you know, they can't do things as simple as hug and can't, we can't share space. So I think that we're, um, you know, right now we're gonna get through it together as much as we can, even though we're separated. Um, but we've got so much healing and we have so much work to create. And I really hope that if I had like my dream, it would be I could work on artwork and work on systems that really show the best of us. You know, I look at, I, you know, I, you know, I look, I, you know, everyone who hasn't done it yet, go to your national park, you know, somewhere in the Shenandoah or in West Virginia and look at the conservation work that was done in the thirties during the depression, you know, that, that stuff is still there. And there's so much work that we can actually do. Um, and there's something, I, I mean, there's a, there, there's been a kind of a sense of hopelessness that nothing matters. Mm -hmm. And I, I really hope that my work and other artists work, we can, we can show you that so much does matter. There's so much left to do. And, and frankly, there's just so many beautiful pictures and beautiful artwork we wanna create. Um, and, and in order to enjoy that beauty is we also have to tackle the hard stuff as well. So there are two 
questions, nice questions maybe to add the conversation on a lighter, on a positive yeah. <laughs> side. And that is, who would be your dream artist to work with? And who is your favorite artist at the Phillips? Who? You can choose, you can choose first or the second first. For, who is your favorite artist at the Phillips? And who is the artist you would want to work the most? Okay, that's that's a challenging one because I, I I'm gonna lie I'm not gonna lie I'm gonna pick like three to four artists at the Phillips because there, there's a there's a hand there, there's like a, a few that really stick out to me. Um, I mean it's it's like goes without saying like you know like I, I really you know there's 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 an artist that um, Rockney Krebs who has a piece at the Phillips. Um, it, it's I don't it's not up right now but. You know, he was another. He was a light artist, a, a laser light kind of artist. Um, he was a studio mate of St Sam Gilliam, and he um, his, his his work is just um, super powerful. And I am glad that the Phillips has one of his pieces. Um, you know, my my great uncle Leland Bell. Uh, it's you know that's kind of because of um, his kind of process of trying to understand like. The kind of combination of color and art and then he also used music in his work which I didn't know until later and it really helped me kind of understand how I could be an artist and not a musician and still be cool with that um there's a really great Louis Villa real piece that's there um that you all have and I was really excited when you had that because you know I'm biased but you know when it's I know it's it's sometimes hard for institutions to get some of the work that we do and it's you know, there's a comfort piece that you all just got that was part of the, um, that, that's really, I mean, that, 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 that piece that you had for the, the warmth of the other suns, that was incredible. I watched that at least a few times. Anyways. Um, and who you would like to collaborate with the most? I mean, so there's, there, there's a couple of people um, that, you know, uh, I mean, I mean, it goes without saying, like Christoph Videnchko is is definitely an artist that I, I've, I've met and I've talked with who I'd love to do a piece with. Um, uh, Raphael Lizana Hemmer is, is another artist who's who's very similar um, with some ideas that I would really like to, to do something with. Um, you know, it's it's interesting because a lot of times when I end up collaborating with people, I I oftentimes more collaborate with musicians or dancers not always visual artists. So it's usually more of a combination of like where we're bringing in different skill sets. Um, so, you know, in some ways, like one thing I, I wanna explore more is I, I do wanna figure out a way to collaborate more with like a curator or like someone who could kind of figure out how to place my stuff. Cause oftentimes I can think of these ideas but I don't always think about how they're gonna last or how they're gonna be. Um, so, you know, I'm. I'm open to, open to a lot of collaborations. That's a great question. I should really have Think more about of a, it. a, a solid answer. And if anyone wants to, you know, feel free to reach out. You know, I, I can't, you know, we only have so much time in this universe, but, um, you know, I, I think my work is always stronger. And I think most people's work is stronger when there's some form of collaboration and uh, I'm excited. And, and I, I do have to just, I think that's a perfect way to say that, like, I'm not alone with who creates my work. Like I mentioned Serrane. Yamahira, who's here next to me, and, and I have tons of other friends and people I've worked with over the years who've made it possible for me to be here right now. And it's, you know, I mean, for anyone who's out there, like, it, I, I just really, I'm like insanely grateful for the, the people who've supported my work, like physically there, helped me carry equipment to people who've said nice things. Um, you know, and I, 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 it's not the same as a collaborator, but it is like a very essential part of what we all do and that kind of communication is um, really supports. Yeah. Well, thank you again so oh. much for spending your night with us. Oh, and no, thank no. you all for sticking around and joining us. It's been a pleasure and I hope you all enjoyed it. And uh, we'll see you around, Robin. Good thank luck with much. Arlington and we'll bring some coats and uh, sweaters and scarves and we'll join you. And it if you be, need anybody be... to carry your equipment, just holler. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll be in uh, the, the Penrose Square tomorrow night. So maybe we'll see you there. Good luck. Okay, you. good night, everybody. Bye-bye.